Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oscar Tu, and I'm a volunteer with Happy Fest Committee. Um, I'll be the moderator for this panel. If you have any questions for our guests, please comment in the YouTube channel uh, comment section, and we will answer them live. Any questions we don't get to will be forwarded to our filmmakers. Um, I'd like to start off by giving a warm welcome to director Yi Chen of First Vote, joining us from um, jo joining us from her her home. He is a documentary filmmaker based in Washington, D.C. Uh, first Vote is her first full-length documentary, and it is currently in distribution with a festival, um, with a festival run at AFI Docs, CanFest, LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, and of course, Happy Fest. Let's also welcome Dr. Jennifer Ho, joining us from Boulder, Colorado. Jennifer is the director of the Center for the Humanities and the Arts at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she also holds, holds an appointment as professor in the Ethnic Studies Department. Finally, let's give a warm welcome to Kaiser Kuo, who is calling in from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. A native of upstate New York, Kaiser has spent 20 years of his adult China returning in 2016. He hosts, he hosts the Seneca podcast, a current affairs podcast that has run Cool. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with the Q&A. Um, so this first question goes to Yi. Um, who was your intended audience for First Vote? And do you feel you are reaching them? Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Oscar. Um, so that's a great question. Um, is the you know the core audience I want to reach is um, definitely AAPI um, voters, um, and I feel like with festivals like Happy Fest, with Cam Fest, and LA um, Asian Pacific Film Festival, I feel you know those are the audience that I'm definitely reaching through um, the festivals, and I also want to reach. Um, audience outside AAPI community to have a better understanding of um, who Asian Americans are. Um, so through AFI docs, that's a great place to reach audience as well. That's interesting. Thanks for telling us that, Yi. Um, so kind of branching off of that, uh, do you feel, how, how did you come across your interview subjects? Or how did you decide who you're gonna interview for this project and, um, how was that influenced by your audience choice and your goal in uh, creating this film? Yeah, I was looking for, um, so I started the project after the 2016 November election. Um, and I was interested in um, a, a story about AAPI voters. Um, and I was um, looking for, um, characters in battleground states and um, from both uh, from both sides, both political parties. So that's kind of the, the parameter that I kind of set for myself and kind of started from there um, looking for, um, for characters. So that's why the film has um, Kaiser and Jennifer who are on the Democrat side and Lance and Sue who are on the um, Republican side and um, and the story takes place in Ohio and North Carolina, which are both um, battleground states. Um, one of the reasons is I do want the impact um, of, of the film to reach um, specifically battleground states, um, in, particularly in 2020. Yeah, that's great. I definitely think uh, we saw a pretty good balance uh, in viewpoints, and um, I think the uh, the focus of our ground states was really interesting. I made the film interesting. Um, this next question is for uh, all of you, but I'll be starting with Kaiser. Um, so, in the film, the influence of WeChat is discussed. Uh, uh, Lance Chan references. Um, the lies of mainstream media when he's addressing his visitors, uh, his uh, listeners. 
Um, how do you feel that the information or media being shared on platforms like WeChat uh, influence political discourse among Chinese Americans? And we're going to start with Kaiser on this one. Yeah, I think it's richly goddamn ironic that he would consider the information on WeChat to be more reliable than what you have on the so-called mainstream media. Uh, WeChat actually is sort of a cesspool of all sorts of uh, of conspiratorial nonsense uh, for the most part, unfortunately. It's also very useful. Um, WeChat is really sort of where my family first sort of discovered that there was such a large number of, of Chinese living in the U.S. who had gone uh, sort of deeply uh, into Trump land, who were uh, embracing anti-immigration policies, who were uh, quite overtly racist a lot of the time. And it was really distressing to me. You know, it, it, that wasn't the WeChat that I had sort of known while living in China and using it you know, to pay for things and to, to grab cabs. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's like all social media. Look, it social media rewards activating language. It, it encourages you to be strident. I mean, you realize very early on in your use of social media that um, thoughtful, balanced, nuanced uh, remarks don't get you a lot of likes, and you don't get that satisfying squirt of dopamine, that reward. And so instead, it, it encourages sort of extremism snarkiness uh stridency and it's it's very unfortunate i think for a lot of political discourse um would anybody like to add to that yeah i actually just tweeted um uh, an article link um to uh columbia journalism review um that i came across when i was researching for the film it um on the how uh, on mis misinformation on WeChat. So um, I personally, I actually think WeChat was uh, invented, I guess, or, or after I left, after, when I was in the United States, um, after I left China. So I personally was not on um, WeChat until I started working on this project. Um, I was asking around if anyone knows um, uh, Chinese American Trump supporters, and they added me to to their WeChat groups. Um, and so that that was like the first time I've ever like used WeChat and like, you know, seeing those groups um, uh, on WeChat. And, and that's actually where I found um, Lance because um, there are a, a few people in Virginia. Um, they told me that they listened to his podcast on WeChat. Um, they told me about this guy in Ohio having this podcast on WeChat. So, um, yeah, so that's actually how I found um, uh, found Lance. Okay. Um, for those of you joining us, um, I am not Oscar. Uh, Oscar had some technical difficulties. Um, so I'm Jessica Kong. I'm the Happy Fest director. Um, so I'll be continuing on with the uh, conversation. Um, before I go to the next question, Jennifer, did you want to add anything to the um, the WeChat conversation? Or okay. So I, um, much to my uh, grandfather's dismay, never learned to speak either Mandarin or Cantonese, and I can't read Chinese. I, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> oh, looks like we have an audience question from Isabella Chen. In regards to WeChat versus the media, is there a more liberal political perspective that Chinese and Chinese Americans can access due to language? That's yeah, a good either. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Heiser. Good. No, there, there certainly are groups of, of people who are more progressive or more liberal on WeChat. Uh, unfortunately, I, I I find them to be vastly outnumbered by people on, on the other mm -hmm. side. And it's a weird amalgam, too. I mean, it's, it's it, politics, of course, uh, doesn't translate perfectly as you cross the Pacific. And so often you'll find people who are quite stridently nationalistic in the Chinese context. Uh, maybe what they have in common with the right in America is their their penchant for authoritarianism, uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's what, what unites them. But people who are uh, both very pro-Trump and perversely also very pro Xi Jinping, uh, you do find them. Uh, you, you find a lot of, of, of liberal progressive groups, both among Chinese and among Chinese Americans on WeChat. But um, by design, uh, there are there are 
public accounts that you can follow. Uh, there are you know large groups of up to 500 people or more. And then there are private ones. The private ones tend to be self-selecting. And unless they are organized around some other principles, so the groups that I was in were about, for example, education, uh, primary and, and, and secondary education uh, in the area that I live, in the Research Triangle area of North Carolina. Uh, and those turned into battlegrounds because those brought together people who had in common only that they were parents of Chinese students, uh, of, of students, and they were from China. Uh, they weren't of one particular political affiliation, but were very quickly taken over by the boisterous and obnoxious Republicans. Um, yeah, I would encourage um, uh, audience to really um, check out that article um, that I tweeted. Um, it's, it's a really great article. And what I've seen on WeChat, um, it's overwhelmingly um, Republican supporters. Um, and I know there are progressive groups on um, WeChat, like API a Vote um, has a WeChat um, group. But the, I, but WeChat is a little different from um, Facebook, but the, because the groups are very, um, uh, it's a pri they're private groups. Um, and it's, it's hard to be in those um, very, like, you know, Republican groups. And if you say something, uh, you know, different, they would kick you out. So it's, it's actually very, it's very different. Um, the groups are very kind of like self, how do I say, how should I say it? They're, they're very like, um, they're, they're private groups. So like, it's hard to get into that space. Um, but I think that the importance of WeChat is like um, immigrants from China, when they were in China, they use WeChat. Um, and um, according to the article, they're like over 800 million users on WeChat. So when those immigrants come to the United States, um, you know, they are already familiar with the app. So this is kind of their go-to social media. Um, they don't necessarily use Facebook or Twitter. And that's where they get their information. And um, I remember um, Kaiser's wife, Fan Fan, told me like when she first moved here, she joined those groups in Chapel Hill, which is more like neighborhood groups, community groups, like where to buy grocery and, and you know, and for like kids and stuff. So, um, yeah, so this is a space that they, they kind of bring over here from China. Um, and it, it's, it's an important space, um, I think, for progressive um, organizations to find a way to reach. So maybe not so much of voters who already have a strong affiliation with certain parties, but maybe more like um, people who are swing voters. Um, I feel like there is a potential um, to reach those, um, uh, those voters. Well, that's a really good point. So do you feel like um, kind of speaking to the Chinese immigrant experience, having that previous experience living in China, do you think that um, that influences their views of American politics, and that's maybe why they kind of lean more towards Republican uh, versus Democrat or lo liberal, or and maybe how they form their political opinions of um, American politics. Uh, if I can answer that one, absolutely. Yeah, I think that uh, it's probably the the single biggest factor in determining uh, their political leanings on coming to the United States um, is the environment that they left. I think that the, the phenomenon that that uh, that he has documented in in this documentary, I think of, of so many of these quite stridently um, conservative, uh, libertarian conservative voters, it has a lot to do with the ethos that prevails in China and has really across most of the last forty years of the reform and opening period, where you have this quite brutal dog eat dog screw you before you screw me kind of an attitude um a lot of these people they themselves were successful in china uh they the ones who climbed to the top of the dog pile and they very much believe in that sort of self-made bootstrapping mythology uh, and they believe that 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 is what america is about so they come to the united states often and uh, they have no patience for anything that would get in the way of their designs, which would be getting my kid into an Ivy League school, for example. And so things like affirmative action uh, become anathema to them, and they really array themselves against that. Uh, and that, that takes them down you know, a, a lot of other, I mean, this sort of 
casual equation of blackness with criminality, a lot of uh, of racism that underpins a lot of a lot of their political beliefs. Uh, don't let them tell you otherwise. They, they won't admit it on camera, but off camera, <laughs> they sure do. Right. And I know you mentioned um, the term blackness, but um, one of the subjects that's subtly, subtly explored throughout the movie is API's perceived whiteness by proximity. Um, why do you think this is, and do you view this as a problem? Um, and if you view this as a problem, why do you think this is an issue? Uh, Jennifer, would you like to weigh in on this? Sure. So yeah, Asian um, Pacific Islanders are often seen as being honorary white or having honorary white status. Uh, the t at the time when I was living in North Carolina, I literally had people tell me that to my face, that Asians for all intents and purposes were white. And I had both black and white Southern friends when I was in New England and about to move to Chapel Hill tell me the same thing. Is it true? No, of course it's not true. Right. And I think the anti-Asian racism in light of COVID-19 is laying bare just what those limits of whiteness or white adjacency really are. Um, certainly the viral video of um, two different Asian Americans of two different Asian ethnicities being attacked by who I'll call racist grandma are evidence of the fact that Asians are not inoculated against racism. Um, there seems to be this strange perception in a lot of the Asian American, Chinese American community that um, the racism that is coming at them is coming from Black people. And I, what I think about that is this misperception that we have where if a member of a minority group does something, it becomes amplified beyond what that one single or a few examples show. So while it's true that there were Black teenagers who attacked a woman in New York City, um, and I think there's one or two instances of that happening in Chicago, I don't know that overwhelmingly it's Black people who are attacking Asians. But I do think that there is some very unresolved anti-Black racism that occurs in various Asian American communities, including the Chinese community, that really needs to be addressed. Uh, so, you know, I, I think white adjacency or the, this idea that somehow Asians, um, like I think buying into the model minority myth is a huge problem. And so just to quickly reference Candace Owens, who is a Black conservative pundit uh, who's been going on Twitter and complimenting Asians and saying that white privilege doesn't exist because of Asian American success, she is hugely problematic. And I see her coming up again and again in Chinese and Asian conservative circles as somehow saying like, here, this, this black woman is saying that George Floyd was a terrible person. And so we can believe her because she's black and she's complimenting us as Asians for succeeding. And isn't that a great thing? And haven't we achieved the American dream? And she's very dangerous and it's very dangerous for people to believe her. I'm sure that anyone who's tuned into this broadcast has actually is not going to believe her, but I would say if you have relatives who are somehow talking about Candace Owens in glowing terms, please correct them. And it's not a compliment to be seen as having white adjacency or to be a model minority. There's a very long history of conservative Americans using uh, Asians as sort of a club uh, to, to, to pitting us against, against blacks and trying to sort of destroy allyship before it can firm up. That's a really good point. Oh, E, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, when I was filming the project, I actually um, learned a lot from Jennifer's classes. And um, I mean, I would definitely recommend two books that um, I read and find extremely helpful. One is um, uh, Ian Haney Lopez, White by Law, and the other one is um, Leslie Bowes, Partly Colored. And I think especially Partly Colored, um, you know, it. it it um, asks um, this question. Um, I'm not quote. I'm not quoting it entirely. Like, I just kind of. I think I remember. If I remember it correctly, like um, in the Jim Crow, like you know, there's a, a Japanese American on the bus. You know, where does he sit? He's not black and he's not white. So like, it, I feel like um, the conversation about race in America tend to be um, very um, black and white. Like very binary. So I think it's also important to talk about it um, not so much in a binary way. And, you know, where Asian American is, you know, in that conversation, I think it's also important. Right. 
Well, and kind of to kind of side note on that, Kaiser, when your daughter had mentioned about being, you know, Asian American and having people not understand or, you know, not understand, but um, question, well, no, but what are you really? Um, I was born here in, in the U.S. and I still get that question too, like, well, no, what is your ethnicity? Like, what are you really? Right. So I, I kind of feel that same kind of uh, limbo kind of aspect whenever you mention about the partially colored, um, partly colored um, comment. Um, Actual foreigner, yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of pivoting a little bit to um, our next question. Um, Advancing Justice estimated that in 2016, there were 9.3 million eligible AAPI voters, but only 5 million turned out. What contributes to this gap? And do you foresee for the 2020 election Oh, I'm sorry. What do you foresee for the 2020 election and beyond? Well, if, if there were 5 million who voted out of 9.3, that's better than than the most of the other the, the population more generally. That's, you know, almost reasonably good voter turnout even uh, for a presidential year. I, I think that um, it's almost certain that we're going to see that number increase. Uh, there has been so much political activation on the part of, of AAPI people, uh, 2020 is going to be a really signal year. I mean, people who uh, are are not drawn to to politics naturally have been brought in sort of unwillingly, kicking and screaming because of what's happened. Uh, not only with the death of of, of George Floyd and, and BLM protests, but also it, during the COVID nineteen pandemic itself, with that uptick that we've talked about in anti Asian. Uh, racial violence. I think that uh, we're probably more aware of it than ever before. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I just would like to see more of them um, vote smart and actually vote not vote against their own interests. I mean, I think statistically, Asian Americans, at least in the last presidential election, voted skewed more towards the Democratic Party than they did the Republican Party. And certainly younger Asian American voters, maybe those who are too young to vote in the presidential election in 2016 and who have come of age now, I'm sure that they're going to come out for the Democratic Party rather than the Republican Party. And I think this is scary to the GOP, the number of younger voters and Asian Americans as a swing vote. So I agree with Kaiser. I'm kind of um, tentatively hopeful that Asian Americans really will come out and that they will vote in their interest, not just ethnically or racially, but they'll vote in their interest if they are trans and they'll vote in their interest if they are women and they'll vote in their interest if they just simply care about basic human decency. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I feel hopeful too. I'm with Kaiser and Jennifer about 2020. Um, I mean, statistically in 2016, um, actually Asian American voter turnout um, has increased to 49.3%, um, which, um, you know, it's still, there is still a 10% gap, racial gap between white voters and Asian American voters. But um, the the trend is, you know, it, it, it's it's increasing every year. So, um, and, the, and there will be 11 million Asian American AAPI voters, eligible voters in 2020. And AAPI is the fastest growing racial group in the United States. And um, organizations like OCA Houston, I know you have your national conference coming up and there is a national API presidential town hall coming up um, in July. So these organizations are really um, doing great civic engagement work. And I definitely feel help, um, very hopeful this year. Yes, I agree. It's been really nice to see all of the town halls and virtual meetups and, you know, planning and resources that have been coming within this past couple of weeks. So I, yeah, I definitely look forward to Jolly as well. Can I say one thing? It's, I think it's also possible that we might see our first Asian American vice presidential candidate, um, Kamala Harris. And, you know, she's mixed race. And so I'm in no way trying to take away from her blackness, but I think it's also really important as a mixed race woman that we really recognize that she has both African um, heritage, specifically through Jamaica and Indian heritage, and that we should be embracing her as an Asian American candidate. And that's really historic to think that she may be mm -hmm. our first vice presidential candidate um, 
and possibly first female VP. And that's very exciting. I, I have mixed feelings about Joe Biden. I will definitely vote Democrat. He's not, he wasn't my first choice, but you know, you take what you can get and you definitely don't want Trump. Yes, <laughs> small strides, right? <laughs> um, yeah, this question is for you, but um, Jennifer and Kaiser, feel free to join in as well. Um, in making this film, have you discovered any strategies in increasing civic participation uh, in AAPIs who are not yet eligible to vote? Um, well, I mean, it's a great question. It, it, I don't know if I have all the answers to that. Um, I, I'll leave it to um, AAPI civic engagement groups. But um, I mean, I think what I want to do, um, you know, with the film is, um, is, you know, really inspiring. That's my hope is the film will inspire AAPI voters um, to you know, vote this November and also, um, uh, you know, reach um, immigrant voters um, um, as well, um, you know. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's what I hope the film will More be. like a conversation starter right, to kind of right. get the ball rolling. Right, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, with the recent protests, what role do you see AAPI playing within the current discussion of racial injustice, specifically discussions centered around the Black experience in this country? And uh, anybody can. That's, that's all you, Jen. <laughs> um, so one of the things I've been doing, because I've been doing a lot of webinars about anti-Asian racism and COVID-19, is to share with people that if they are against people being racist towards them, if they identify as Asian American and if they're against anti-Asian racism and the uptick of it during COVID-19, they have to also hopefully already have been against anti-Black racism. So in other words, you can't just decide you're against anti-Asian racism because it's impacting you or it's impacting your loved ones, your friends, your family. You have to also recognize that anti-Asian racism is also in, in the same systemic injustice as anti-Black racism and as all forms of systemic racism. So I think that Yi's film can really be a conversation starter about civic engagement and getting involved. And um, like, it's really, in, so one of the most intriguing moments to me in Yi's film is when um, she's filming Sue at, in Wilmington, North Carolina at a Republican, some kind of statewide Republican convention. And there's a white woman who is praising Sue Gouge as, um, you know, being sort of the exactly what the, the Republican Party needs. And she refers to her as both contagious. She talks about her being contagious. And then she calls her um, like some kind of cookie, like a Chinese, she, she says like she's some kind of Chinese cookie, yeah. right? Right. And, um, and I saw that and I was like, that is so racist and awful, right? And sexist. Like there's so many layers of terribleness in what she said. Um, but she invites it. I, I think yeah. she probably saw, so, you know, it's so intriguing to me why somebody like Sue would probably see that as a compliment and somebody like me would see it as an absolute insult. It's also interesting that, you know, Yi is, Yi is, a, is an immigrant, right? Is an immigrant from China and has such different political viewpoints and attitudes than Lance and Sue. So, you know, all of this is really kind of interesting and complex, but definitely worth talking about. About, right, like I'm hoping that if anyone's watching this and you're an educator, that please show first vote in your class and please, you know, use it as a starting off point to have these really important conversations about race and civic engagement. No, absolutely. And uh, kind of bringing up, since you brought up Lance and um, Sue, we actually have an audience question. Um, while filming, uh, this is from Eugene Lee. While filming, how were you able to convince Lance and Sue to let you film them? Ye. Yeah. Um, how did I? Um, it, so first of all, it took a long time to find these two characters. It took about six months. Um, and I talked to lots of like lots of um, uh, members of the Chinese American for Trump group, and they weren't. They were willing to talk to to me, like you know, uh, uh, on the phone or in person or whatever. But they weren't. They weren't willing to be on camera, so it really took a long time. And 
I mean, I think in retrospect, um, you know, I think one is they were already, so Sue was already a public figure um, and, and Lance, you know, he has this podcast show. Um, so I think that was one factor. Um, and, um, you know, the way I approached them was, um, I was very honest about like, you know, who I was and my intention, um, that, you know, I also, I, I think the, sec the another reason is probably because I do share, um, similar, um, in terms of immigration background with Sue and Lance, um, that I am also an immigrant, um, you know, from China. And at the time I was becoming a naturalized citizen and I was becoming a first time, first time voter. Um, so, you know, and Lance um, and Stu, you know, they became first time voter in 2016. So I told them I was interested in getting to know Chinese American voters on both, uh, on both sides. And I was becoming a voter. So, you know, I wanted to become a more informed voter. Um, so that's how I approached them. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I, I think from my perspective in retrospect, those are probably um, the main, main reasons. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, so we know that, you know, 2020 is both a census year and an election year. Um, do you, do you think that the census is important and what impact do you think the census can have on the AAPI population? And what can we do, you know, to, um, as our due diligence to help, you know, get people out to vote and get people to complete their census? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously the census is important because it's the census that determines your representation, uh, as we pointed out. AAPIs represent one of the fastest growing, the fastest growing segment uh, among voters. Um, the the fact that they included a citizenship question on on this uh, census it was off putting. I, I got a phone call from my mother, for example, who was really just livid. She was just shocked, and she was suspicious of this. You know, she had never, uh, I, I guess, she'd been out of the country for a very long time, and and. Um, Probably it was my father before he had passed who filled out the census form. And when she received one, um, she was sort of panicked by it. And uh, even though you know he's a naturalized American citizen, uh, it, it really bothered her. Um, I think she has live-in help from from the Philippines, and then she was worried about whether they how to report them and all this stuff. So uh, I, I can imagine just extrapolating from that one example. That there are a lot of people who are sort of freaked out by it. So I think what we should be doing is all of us talk, especially to our older relatives, and allay their fears about this thing and make them understand how important it is to, to answer it accurately, um, in spite of the, the off-putting citizenship question. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just want to second what Kaiser says. I think that, you know, and this is a message that I know you has talked about with respect to first vote. At the end of the day, what we really want is to feel like we belong. You know, that's the one thing I think that the four of us have in common. We want to feel like we belong here in the United States. And so filling out the census and being counted is one small way of saying, I belong, I'm here. And voting is a way of saying my voice matters. And I think one of the most American things you can do for those people who are inclined to want to be patriotic is to dissent, is to say, here are the things about the United States I wish were different. Here are the ways that I can speak out about them. And then here are the things I can do to change them. And one of those things is through voting. Absolutely. You, would you like to comment or? Uh, sure. I mean, it says it's extremely important and Kaiser already um, explained it. Um, I mean, this year, I think I've seen a lot of great work coming out of API organizations, um, really like um, doing a lot of great community organizing to get API community to um, uh, to fill our census. So language access is obviously a big barrier, um, but they were able to uh, do a lot of translation in different languages. Um, and also I've seen AAPI congressional uh, members really taking on leadership roles and really um, 
uh, you know, have done a, a lot of great work um, in terms of um, uh, uh, census this year. Thank you. Thank you all for weighing in. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So now that, you know, first vote is is over with and now you're kind of doing the fruit festival circuit, aside from aside from that, what up upcoming projects do you have um, Yi, as far as filmmaking, and then also to Jennifer Kaiser, what upcoming projects do you have as well? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm working on the new project. Um, I, I, um, I can't really talk too much about it, but yes, I'm working on the new project. Okay. <laughs> so follow Wait. social media, Yi social yes, media, so you yes. can keep in, in touch. <laughs> Kaiser? Um, you know, I, I've got a, a, a lot to, to wrestle with right now. Uh, U.S.-China relations, which is the thing that I, I care about the most, is in a, an extraordinarily precarious place. Uh, of course, a lot of how that shakes out will, will be determined by who we elect with the, the composition of the Senate and the House are uh, come, come January of next year. So I'm sort of combining both of the, those things uh, in, in the activities that I'm pursuing. I'm involved in a number of initiatives that are aimed at bringing more reasonable voices back into the conversation about U.S.-China relations, and those have a, a strong policy dimension to them, uh, formulating policy recommendations to an incoming administration uh, in six different issue areas, including uh, national defense and national security, uh, trade and American competitiveness, technology, human rights, uh, the environment and climate, and uh, society and values, the difficulties that we've encountered when you have sort of corporatist structures uh, from China that are having difficulty coexisting with a pluralist society like ours on our campuses and whatnot. And so these are six different issue areas that we've got really spectacular groups of people working on to come up with policy recommendations that are aimed at specific policy actors to really hopefully turn things around in the US-China sphere. Uh, if we don't get this right, it all goes to hell. So absolutely focused on. And are these initiatives tied to your podcast, uh, Seneca podcast, or are they separate? Um, they, they're, they're technically separate though. I, I am not shy about using Seneca uh, as sort of a a megaphone. I'm bringing a lot of these people who are involved in these initiatives on. I, I don't make any, I don't do the sort of both sides thing or the you know the equal time. I tend to bring on guests whose perspectives I, uh, I, I would myself champion. Uh, it's only in rare instances that I'll bring on somebody. It's not an adversarial show, so uh, that's just not its nature. So no, I, I haven't kept perfect church-state separation there. And Jennifer? So my ongoing project is to end racism, which I know is a completely naive, idealistic pie in the sky goal as an educator, but it's just true. And so I'm working on ongoing projects related to educating people about the things that they can do to also be anti-racism educators and ally. That's really my evangelical message of the day. I believe that everyone no matter what your party affiliation is, no matter what your ethnicity, your racial background is, anyone can be an anti-racism educator and ally. You simply need to decide that that's what you want to do. Then you need to educate yourself about the history of racism in the United States. And then you have to start talking about um, racism um, and you have to start doing anti-racism things. So in other words, it's not enough to be a decent human being and not say racist things. Like if you're not using um, racial slurs, kudos to you for being a decent human being, but that doesn't mean that you're an anti-racist. Being an anti-racist means actively being anti-racist, which means acting and doing things actively to be anti-racist. Absolutely. Jessica, can I add something? Um, yes, please. I, I just want to add that um, uh, for first vote, um, I'm also, um, you know, I we I would love to do more community screenings um, in the summer and early fall. Um, so I 
want to put it out there if any api civic engagement organizations are interested please let me know um and they can reach me on the website firstvotefilm.com and you know kaiser and jennifer and me we would we'll love to do more community screenings this year and we'd be willing to do them with lance and sue too <laughs> Have you had them in any interviews yet, um, Yi, for your panels or? Uh, not yet, but uh, but um, I, 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 we're kind of planning something with Jennifer. Oh, awesome. We're hoping to plan something with Jennifer. <laughs> oh, that's great. And um, you mentioned your next screening for um, First Vote, uh, June, June 19th. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to share any other screenings or um events on how they can or ways that they can get to um first vote screening yeah definitely so our next screening is at afi docs which is on june 19 um and so they can go to afi docs website find the film and um order the the ticket um and so the one after that is in july um, and audience can find the information um, again on our website, firstvotefilm.com. There is a screening page that um, I keep updating if there are more screenings um, coming up. And follow us on social media, First Vote Film. And my Twitter handle is C35Films. Awesome. And then just, um, just to kind of wrap up, um, I know we've kind of touched on it throughout the interview, but uh, just kind of overall, what are your final takeaways? What are your final thoughts um, for the audiences in terms of what they should take away from this film or what you what you hope that they they gain from this film? Um, I, you know, I definitely hope they'll vote in November. Um, and I also hope that it will start um, an important conversation on um, AAPI civic engagement. Um, and and voting um, and also you know um, other issues exploring the film in terms of race and racism. When I you know made the film in 2017, 2018, um, and even last year, I would never, I would not have expected um, uh, the very unusual situation right now with so many going on. Um, and the film is. Um, more relevant than ever that I could imagine with everything going on now. So um, I definitely um, hope that more people will see the film and I hope that they uh, will be able to, um, the film will, will start you know, a, a conversation um, because uh, it's, it's really relevant to a lot of the things that are going on right now. Awesome. Um, anybody want to add anything or did you wrap it up for everyone? Yeah, I think she wrapped it up nicely. Uh, I hope everyone gets <laughs> out there and votes and votes Democrat in, in November. <laughs> well, thank y'all so much for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure talking to all of y'all. Uh, we hope that you have a great evening. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so thank much. you. And thanks to Oscar too. Yes. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> So that concludes our Q&A for today. If you have any last minute questions that you wish to add, uh, please leave a comment in the comment section or email us at happyfest at ocahouston.org and we'll be sure to send it to the panelists today. Um, I would like to mention that tomorrow we, have, we are continuing in our 10th day of films. Uh, we will be showcasing the five-part docu-series from PBS, Asian Americans. So please go to www.happyfest.com to reserve your tickets. Um, before we end, I'd like to bring attention to the current racial injustices that our Black communities are facing. We as AAPI are standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. So please visit tinyurl.com slash BLMAAPI, all caps, to learn concrete Houston-specific ways to be involved. We will also be conducting a special panel this Sunday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time to discuss the current climate and ways we can engage and best implement our calls to action. 
Uh, we will also be rescreening one of our films from this year, Black Ghost Sun, and we'll be talking to the director and his team uh, for a more in-depth conversation. So please stay tuned for that. That concludes our ninth day of films. Please join us tomorrow and thank you for joining in tonight. It's happy Fest. We hope you have a good evening. We would like to acknowledge the grief and outrage right now, especially within our black communities. Our city, Houston, continues to hurt. George Floyd was a native Houstonian and according to the Houston Chronicle, we have had six police killings this past month alone. As Asian Americans, we have to acknowledge and interrogate our own anti-Blackness and relative privilege within American society. We have to actively unlearn our own biases. It was Black activists who pushed against racist naturalization laws and supported Asian Americans after the racist murder of Vincent Chen. Black activists stepping into action have benefited our community in profound ways. We must move beyond being a bystander and join the larger movement of Black Lives Matter. Join us in donating, protesting, petitioning, educating ourselves, and supporting our Black brothers and sisters in whatever way we can. Visit tinyurl.com slash B-L-M-A-A-P-I, all caps, for more detailed ways to help, including Houston-specific bail funds, scripts to call local representatives, and translated letters to our family members all of which you can join us in doing in between screenings. On behalf of OCA Greater Houston and the Happy Fest Committee, thank you for joining us on this broadcast.